Here's the better question to ask. Did they hear what they needed to hear so they can do something with it? That's the better question, right? Paul understood something that most of us have a hard time grasping. Communication is not about the communicator, it's about the listener. As a preacher, I love preaching Paul's letters. Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Romans. There's just so many amazing things in Paul's letters. And because of the volume of his writing in the New Testament, it just ends up being a normal thing to teach on Paul's teaching at some point often in your ministry. But there's so much that we can learn, not just from the content of Paul's teaching, but how he approached his ministry. So as something different in this episode, I want to talk about five really practical things that we can learn from Paul, the man, Paul himself. These are things that are pretty obvious observations, but sometimes those kind of things can be the ones that we miss. So as preachers and as ministry leaders, church leaders, it's important for us to learn from someone as influential as Paul, and especially someone who has contributed so much of the content of what we teach, 70% of the New Testament is uh, from Paul, his writings. And so I just think it's a pretty cool thing to look into what he does and how he does it, not just what the content of his teaching is. So we're going to dive into that and we're going to explore some things that we as preachers and church leaders can learn practical things for ministry from Paul, the apostle. And if you don't know where you are, my name is Lane and this is the Preaching Donkey Podcast. Welcome. This is episode 71. I'm so glad you're here. We talk about preaching on this podcast, how to preach better, how to preach more effectively, how to communicate more clearly so that your messages can do what you want them to do, which is to spur people towards life change. So if you want to dive further into that, go to preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. You can pick up my free 21 day guide to creating killer sermons. This is a three week, three step process that will walk you through how to create and deliver a message that is compelling and spurs people towards life change. And so if you're new to preaching, this is a great resource, totally free, and it will give you the tools you need to kind of um, put yourself on a path towards studying and creating a message that is going to be helpful to you. And if you've been preaching for a long time, I tell you, I've been preaching for a long time. I'm always looking for new resources. I'm always looking for new things that can help me. So even if you've been preaching for a while, this will help you. This will be a, fr a refresher. It'll be something that will give you new tools to work with. So go to preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. And if you're watching here on YouTube, I'll drop that link in the description and at the top of the comments. Five practical things. This is, if you're watching on YouTube, this is from an article that I wrote years ago on Preaching Donkey called uh, Five Practical Things Preachers Can Learn from Paul. This was in October of 2014. Back when, uh, if you can see, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see that my graphic design skills were not what they are today. And I'm, I'm no designer today, but man, they were bad back then. <laughs> I just, anyway, it worked. It was good enough. In our effort to become better preachers, we often learn from the best preachers in our generation. We watch the superstars and take notes and glean all we can from them. This, by the way, is a good thing. While you should never seek to copy someone else or become them, you can always learn a great deal from studying best practices. I'm still a fan of this idea. I'm less of a fan of superstars, though. I think since 2014, and this is totally an aside, has nothing to do with the content of today's message or today's podcast. But I, in 2014, I was enamored by celebrity pastors. And I'm less enamored these days. I'm more cautious about celebrity pastors. We've just seen so many fall and so many structures that are unhealthy in churches that have a superstar at the top. That being said, some of those people are some of the best communicators out there. So I'm still all for learning from them and learning practices, best practices, how to communicate how to uh, kind of reach out and capture your listeners and bring them into a, a message. That, that's a powerful thing. That's a lot of what we talk about here on this channel and on this podcast. But I'm wary of superstars. I'm wary of Christian celebrities. Uh, 
I think it's a dangerous thing. And I just, I guess I felt like saying that. But we have a lot to learn, not only from our contemporaries, but also from those who have gone before. One leader and preacher who we can learn a great deal from is Paul. Paul the Apostle was not only a top-notch theologian who wrote a huge part of the New Testament, he was also a missionary, a pastor, a church planter, and a movement leader. We can gain a lot from watching his life and ministry. So here are the five practical things we can learn from Paul. Number one, Paul relied on the prompting of the Holy Spirit. The discussion of whether churches should carefully plan out their ministry strategy or rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance creates a false dichotomy. It leads some to assert that if you truly rely on the Holy Spirit, you will not make plans, but rather you will show up and have faith and God will lead you in the moment. Those who take this view tend to view planning and strategy as less spiritual and less faith-filled endeavors. On the other side are those that say you must plan every detail in advance and carefully think through the strategy. These people sometimes believe that those who fail to plan are not being responsible to their calling. So this is a false dichotomy. Those of us who wish to take part in God's mission should absolutely do both planning and relying on the Holy Spirit. And this really is my contention here is that there are those who would say, you know, if you work on your craft as a preacher, if you seek to be better, if you seek to communicate more clearly, this must mean that you are no longer relying on and dependent upon the Holy Spirit and his guidance. And that is a false way of thinking. You are not only working on your communication. You are not only working, in this case, on strategies and plans for your church, for the way you lead it. You are not only doing that. You are also relying on and dependent on the Holy Spirit's guidance as a part of that process. It is not and should not be one or the other. It is both. It is a both and, not an either or. And I think sometimes... We get in these boxes where we think it has to be this way and it can't be that way. And the truth is, in this issue, it is both. We rely on and we are dependent upon the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, we use our capacity for planning and strategy. And in our case, learning how to use every ounce of talent and every ounce of skill we have to communicate clearly the message of the gospel. That's what we're after. It's both and. At the same time, we must realize that we are doing supernatural work that needs supernatural intervention to be effective. If you've ever preached and cared about what you're preaching, you know that preaching at its root is a supernatural activity. Something happens when you preach. And you can prepare yourself blue in the face, but you still have to get up there and the Holy Spirit still has to work and move in people's lives or none of it matters. We should pray like we mean it and rely heavily on the Holy Spirit. Paul set an example as one who both worked relentlessly and had an utter reliance on the Holy Spirit's leading. He said in Colossians 1, 28 and 29, him we proclaim, that is Jesus, him, re, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Verse 29, he says, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Here you see a combination between human efforts, right? He's saying, I toil, I'm working, not for my salvation, that's not what I'm saying. I'm working on behalf of these people to show them Jesus, to show them who he is, to proclaim the gospel to them. For this, I toil, I struggle with all my energy, no, with all his energy that he works within me. So it is a combination. We rely on the Holy Spirit we walk in his steps, and at the same time, we put forth all the effort we can, exhausting every natural piece of talent God has given us, and then some, and together these things go together. So Paul relied on the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and and he was a guy who worked to make sure that he was bringing it to the table. So what can we learn from this, this first thing? 
Our preaching must always be a result of both relentless work and dedicated prayer. That's the takeaway. It must always be a result of both relentless work. Relentless work, meaning that this is a skill, it is an endeavor that cannot and should not ever be exhausted. You should never, as a preacher, get to the point where you just kind of sit back and go, huh, I've learned everything I'm supposed to learn. I know everything I'm supposed to know. Those preachers, you can tell, when they get to that point, they stop, they, they the, the world kind of gets out ahead of them and they're left behind. And I don't mean that they need to change the content of their message or the theology. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that they have lost their edge and you can tell. You just can see it. You can feel it. It takes relentless work to continue to be a person who God uses to capture and maintain people's attention so that they can hear the word of Christ and do something with it. So that's relentless work, and it's also dedicated prayer. It's also praying that God would, in his power, do something through you and in you to affect change on these people that are sitting in front of you. So Paul did both, but he relied on the prompting of the Holy Spirit, and I love that. Number two, Paul was into forming churches, not just converts. He always focused on forming gospel communities that form gospel communities. The gospel moves forward through a local church. No one is converted to remain an island, but rather to connect in community in a church body. Our preaching is one of the best tools we have to build up the body of Christ by leading people into community. So Paul wasn't just about getting people to make a decision. Paul was about making disciples. He was about making disciples who made disciples. And you can see this when he would write letters, not to individuals as much. He did that a little bit. He wrote a letter to Timothy, uh, but he would write letters to churches mostly. He would write letters to the church at Corinth. He would write letter a letter to the church, churches in Galatia. Why? Because he was into forming churches, not just converts, because he understood that conversion on the individual level, happens best in the context of community where people, a body of believers, have together decided to form a a body that is made up of people who are following Jesus and who want to live in his way. So Paul was into churches. What's the takeaway for us? Well, be, be about getting people to not just experience an individual uh, experience with Jesus that they never share with anybody, but be about showing people how to multiply their faith. What does it look like to live in such a way that you are multiplying your faith and bringing more people into the community? Now, I said this was obvious. These are not things that you haven't heard about. These are not things that you haven't taught about. You've probably taught about this, but it's really, really refreshing for us to remind ourselves of of what example we see in the New Testament. Number three, Paul adapted his messages to his listeners. Without Without ever compromising the truth of the gospel, Paul was winsomely in tune with the culture. He sought to be all things to all people. We see that in 1 Corinthians 9, 22 and 23, so that he might reach as many people as possible with the gospel. This is a practice we must adapt as preachers. A lot of preachers focus on the content, asking themselves, did I say all the words that I need to say? So you get through with the message. You think this is especially true if you're a new preacher. I used to obsess over every word. I would think about the words I was going to say. I would think about, I would rehearse. I would focus on, oh, I've got to say it in this way because this is going to be the most powerful way to say this thing. And I'd finish a message and I would sit down and I would go, oh gosh, did I, did, I, did I say everything exactly how it's supposed to be said? Did I leave anything out? And I would just obsess over it. And what I found is that the better question to ask focuses more on the listener and less on me. Here's the better question to ask. Did they hear what they needed to hear so they can do something with it? That's the better question, right? Paul understood something that most of us have a hard time grasping. Communication is not about the communicator. It's about the listener. 
Communication is about the end result. Did they hear something they can apply? That will change their life. If you preach in a way that makes sense to you at the expense of your listeners, you have not done your job as a preacher. If you preach to win the approval of your seminary profs, then you can be sure that most of your listeners probably aren't tracking. Be willing to communicate in a way that is accessible to everyone in your audience. This is something Paul did very well. If he was talking to the religious elite, he would speak like an, a, a religious elite. If he was talking to political leaders, he would speak in terms of civic and political issues. If he was speaking to common people, he would use common language. Paul was willing to adjust not the content of his message, but the way he communicated the most important message that he had, which was the gospel of Jesus. Number four, Paul focused on his focused his message on Jesus. We talk about a lot of stuff. We could stand to talk about Jesus more than all the other things we talk about. Paul was hyper-focused on Jesus. His life was personally changed by him, and he wanted others to know Christ and him crucified. Paul even talked at one point about, he said, you know, I've heard and you've talked about there's people that are preaching Christ uh, because of vain conceit. They're preaching price, Christ out of selfishness or their own ambition. But nevertheless, I rejoice because Christ is preached. Paul's focus, now that doesn't mean that we, we ought to just be corrupt and as long as we're preaching Christ, everything's fine. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is Christ, Paul was so hyper-focused on preaching Christ and him crucified, he would take the W even if it was coming out of the mouth of someone who was only doing it for selfish gain because he wanted Christ preached. So the takeaway there is, is our message focused on Jesus? Is Jesus the hero of our message? Is he the one who we point people to to show that it can be done. Because here's the thing, a lot of preaching can just, a, a lot of preaching could just be motivational speaking. A lot of preaching could just be, here's how to have a better life, here's how to have a better marriage, here's how to uh, be a better parent, here's how to live with less stress and anxiety. All of that could literally just be motivational speaking and it could be completely absent the gospel if you don't show people that the only way to live this way, the only way to have that kind of life, the only way to actually live in freedom is if Jesus enables you to do that. If you are surrendered to him and you are in Christ and he is empowering you to live this way through his spirit, that's the only way to do it. And so when our messages don't focus on Jesus and it's just, here's how to be a better Christian, here's how to live more morally, here's how to be a better husband, and it's absent any enabling power of the Holy Spirit or any reliance on Jesus and him crucified, well, guess what? You're going to, at the end of the day, there's going to be a lot of people who walk away from that feeling the same way that they would walk away from any, you know, motivation seminar, just feeling like, well, I guess it's on me to think more positively and live better, and that's not the gospel, right? I'm not saying you can't preach on that stuff. I'm not saying that people don't need to know how to avoid debt and be a better husband. Those things are all important. The point is, the way anything is done when we preach is Jesus is the hero of the story. So it's not be a better person. It's trust and rely and have faith in him at a higher, more surrendered degree, and his power, his energy will work in you as you bring uh, the, your your life, your stuff, your mess to him. Now, again, this is all stuff you know. If you're listening to this, I'm assuming you know this. I'm assuming you teach this. It's just a reminder because all of us need this. Number five, Paul worked in teams. Paul models something incredibly important to ministry success, partnership. He refers often to co-laborers in the gospel. He was not alone, and neither should we try to do the work of ministry alone. I think prep and planning that goes into preaching is best done in teams. I'm going to talk about this in a later episode. I talk about this in my course and in my book, the course uh, Killer Sermons Academy. You can find that at preachingdonkey.com slash courses. But I think some of the best ways to make a message and a, the, one of the best ways to do what we just talked about relying on the Holy Spirit, forming churches, not just converts, adapting your message to your listeners, focusing everything on Jesus is to work in a team to do it because these are all things that we miss. And sometimes 
even if we think we're doing it well, we'll still miss it. But in a team, you can avoid some of the common pitfalls and you can enhance some of the strengths of all these things that we talked about. So again, we'll talk about that in a later episode or you can check out Killer Sermons Academy over at preachingdonkey.com slash courses. So those are my five takeaways from our boy, Paul. What are yours? I would love to hear in the comments if you're watching here on YouTube, if you're listening on one of the podcast players, hit me on email or just write a review. Let me know what you think there uh, about the show. Be sure to grab your free 21 day guide to creating killer sermons. You can grab that at preachingdonkey.com slash 21 days. I love you. I appreciate the work you do. You matter. Your ministry matters. I'll see you next week.